than Sir Lawrence uh, Friedman, and I'm going to introduce him uh, shortly. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to I, uh, invite Karen Rekacek, who's the uh, chairperson of the National Liberal Club, uh, to give a well, word of welcome from the club to all of those of you who are here. Karen. Thank you very much indeed. A very warm welcome to the National Liberal Club and particularly to our guests online. It's a real pleasure to host this evening in conjunction with Liberal International and I'm delighted to have been given the opportunity by Lord Alderdice to say a few words before the lecture commences. I'd just like to say a few words about the club. We were founded in 1882 and we currently have just over 2,500 members, 2,527 to be precise. The age range is from 17 until 100. Our oldest member is currently 100 and going very strong, which we're all delighted about. We offer town, country, and very importantly, overseas membership. I know it's difficult for members of the this evening to be able to see our premises online, but if you take a look at our website, you will see some of our beautiful rooms, our smoking room, our dining room, and we have the best terrace in London. It really comes into its own in the summer months, but also in the autumn and particularly on New Year's Eve to watch the firework display coming off the London Eye. And I do hope once the lecture is finished this evening that if you are interested to see the club, that you will speak to my chair of membership who is sitting on the front row and he will very happily provide tours and additional information. We offer 50 club circles and forums. These include politics and business, language and culture, theatre and arts, sport and recreation. Very importantly as well, we have over 370 reciprocal clubs around the world. And again, this is really helpful for overseas members who are members of the club. If they are traveling, likewise with people traveling out of London, if you find yourself in New York, you have the choice of six clubs. If you're in Anchorage, if you're in Punta Arena, there is a club which provides a home from home for our National Liberal Club members. If you are interested in finding out more, as I said, please speak to Adrian. The application form is also available online. I will now hand back to Lord Alderdice. I unfortunately have to leave to go to a committee meeting, which I've just stepped out of to speak, but I am sure you will have a most provoking, interesting evening with our speaker. Thank you very much indeed. Karen, thank you very much indeed. And as I said, I really can't think of any more, anyone more suitable uh, to give a lecture this evening at this time on understanding what is happening with modern war warfare in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war. Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman is Emeritus Professor now of, of War Studies at King's, uh, but he was professor there from uh, 1982 to 2014 and vice principal from 2003 to 2013. He was educated up north at Whitley Bay Grammar School and also at the universities of Manchester, York and Oxford before joining King's. He had research positions at Nuffield College Oxford, at IISS and at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Uh, he became a fellow of the British Academy in 1995, CBE in 1996, official historian of the Falklands War, and then KCMG in 2003, uh, and appointed uh, in 2009 to the inquiry into the Iraq War. I don't know what bad thing you did that you got appointed to that, but, but uh, it, was, it was a very important inquiry uh, indeed. Um, uh, he has written many significant papers uh, and a number of very significant books. And tonight he's going to address us on what the Russia-Ukraine war can tell us about modern conflict. For myself and uh, for Rob Johnson, uh, this is particularly interesting because of our roles with the Changing Character of War Centre uh, at Pembroke College in Oxford. Uh, for some, uh, I know, have just come back from Ukraine. And so, uh, actually, you may wish to not only uh, ask questions but make comments later on. Uh, but for the moment, we're going to ask uh, Lawrence to... Uh, to lecture to us for about half an hour, and then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A uh, after that. 
Lawrence, uh, thank you very much indeed. The floor is yours. I'm just looking at the television there. It appears if I stand up, my head is lost. But, uh, <laughs> um, so maybe I'll sit down again. Sure um, thing. Yeah, well, we don't want you to lose your head. No, no, <laughs> it's a bit dangerous. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, it's a delight to be here and not only see some very many old friends in the audience as well. Um, I actually met Isaiah Berlin um, when I was at Oxford. Um, all I can remember is he talked very fast indeed. Um, uh, what he said, I'm sure I, I wish I'd remembered, but I didn't. <laughs> My other sort of, um, when I hear his name, think of a moment um, in my career. You mentioned I was at Chatham House. Uh, I had a Russian, uh, a Soviet, um, who sort of had befriended me. And I, and I wasn't quite sure what to do about this because every Christmas he would invite me round um, uh, invite me for, 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 for a lunch, in which he would give me a bottle of something. Uh, and I, I thought this was a bit awkward, uh, especially as the next dinner was planned just after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So I thought, I'll have to buy him a present too. And I bought him uh, Berlin's uh, book on Russian liberals, uh, <laughs> which seemed to be appropriate. Not long after that, the, the chap from MI5 came to see me and said, uh, you do realize that, someone can't remember his name, you do realize that... Uh, He's a member of the KGB, I said, but he's not very bright. And he said, but you're not very important. <laughs> uh, so that, that was my dealings with the world of spies. Um, I, I'm going to talk about a more somber subject, which is uh, the ongoing war in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. I'm wary about talking about lessons from the war. Um, wars are not set up as educational experiences, they're all very different, um, and the factors of chance that come in to the way that wars develop, which mean that you can draw lessons without always being aware of the circumstances in which they took place. Uh, so I think it's useful to think about what this war is telling us about how wars are fought these days, and there are some aspects uh, which are, are obvious uh, that hit you that would be relevant in all wars in the future, of which the role of drones seems to me the most obvious. Um, but just to, as a word, so what, what one is also this war isn't over uh, by any means, it's got some way to go, unfortunately. Uh, so, anyway, what one is saying now is preliminary, we have to wait uh, until we've got a better sense of what happened. And we've also got to be aware um, that it goes through stages and what one thinks are the lessons, what one thinks um, uh, uh, stand out at particular stages, uh, don't necessarily uh, stick out in the future. And let me start by giving an example of that, which is uh, after the Russian annexation of Crimea and the uh, development of the conflict in the Donbass in 2014, and a lot of what was going on <clears throat> around that, including cyber attacks, the various information campaigns the Russians were winning, or were, were not winning, uh, were running, um, the idea of hybrid war took place. And if you look at much of the literature on warfare from uh, 2014 onwards, this idea of hybrid war um, is very much to the fore. The origin of, the, of this, the, the origin of the term, in fact, goes back to the Israeli um, campaign uh, in the Lebanon in 2006, or indeed the Hezbollah campaign against Israel, more like it, when it was seen that different forms of warfare could coexist at the same time. This was not a surprise. It, it often happened. Um, but uh, what, what, what did happen it, it, with, you, with Russia and Ukraine is, is uh, Gerasimov, the general... Um, who's still in charge of the Russian armed forces, had given a speech in which he seemed to be talking about what we understand as, as hybrid war. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Mark Galliotti, decided to turn this into a doctrine, the Gerasimov doctrine, something which he bitterly regretted afterwards because he decided this wasn't actually what had happened. But for a while, everybody talked about hybrid war as essentially the idea of hybrid war, which was being waged against us. It wasn't very hybrid the Ukrainians, 
um, was about undermining society, things that in the past would have been called sabotage or subversion or propaganda, uh, but this time facilitated through um, the internet, through modern media, uh, social media, and so on. So that hybrid war became a thing. The European Union sort of adopted it. So when um, in Belarus, when the Belarusians were trying to use uh, bring migrants into Belarus in order to push them into Poland, this was described as hybrid warfare. Uh, the, the better ways of talking about it. But, but but this, if you read lots of books prior to the full-scale invasion, this was seen as a future of war because it was seen as a way by which you could operate in this sort of gray area between peace and war without risking the escalation to full-scale war. Well, people don't talk about hybrid warfare much anymore because the warfare that we're seeing in Ukraine has not got many hybrid elements. It's a pretty full-on war. Indeed, the elements that we thought that were hybrid, cyber, information campaigns, have not been that important. Cyber, the, the Russians tried cyber attacks uh, right at the start of the war. They were very intensive, uh, probably the most intensive ever attempted, uh, but they didn't work. Uh, be, or, or there were remedies found, and this was because a number of companies uh, Microsoft, uh, Starlink, one has to say, came in and uh, rescued the situation. So though we were expecting um, disruption of, of uh, network communications in Ukraine right at the start, they didn't happen. Indeed, the Russians found themselves using Ukrainian communications because they didn't bring their own with them. And of course, this is why they suffered um, some awkward losses of commanders early on because it was easier to pinpoint where they were. Equally with the, in <clears throat> with the information campaigns, great activity on social media and elsewhere, but if you look at the effects, pretty marginal. The, the most important effects of, of uh, these campaigns are in Russia. I mean, they convince themselves, but they have had limited effect of convincing uh, people in the West they're more effective, um, in, in, I hate the term, but we'll use it for simplicity, the global south, uh, because uh, th these campaigns can work when they're playing on pre-existing doubts and divisions, but they don't create the divisions in themselves. So the elements that we were sort of expecting to be really important turned out not to be important, and instead we had a war that turned out to be pretty basic uh, in its methodology, elemental even, uh, with the temptation to refer back to the, to, the, to the Great War when you look at the trench warfare uh, and the artillery barrages. In fact, the war in Ukraine from 2014 was always an artillery war. Uh, in the Donbass, it was always an artillery war. And most modern wars are artillery wars, with ISIS or, or, or wherever. Uh, the, the, part of the mythology of modern warfare is it's all about maneuver. And as we've discovered um, in the Ukraine, maneuver is very difficult, but artillery, that keeps on going. Now, to, to, to frame, therefore, the way that w I find it interesting to talk about the war, I think it's useful to uh, look at two traditions, one that we now associate with the West and the other that we associate with Russia. The, uh, and they overlap to a degree. But the one we associate with the West, which is just being followed by Ukraine, is a rather classical approach to warfare. Warfare should be seen as a battle, as a contest between regular armies. It should not involve civilians. It should not be directed against civilians. But that if you can win a decisive battle by defeating your opponents, then, uh, uh, then that should settle the matter so that the key contest is between armies and navies, air forces. The alternative approach, which we can associate with Russia, um, is what I'd call a total war approach. Now, going back to um, the interwar years and the, and the Second World War uh, and onto the nuclear age, this was seen as the age of total war um, because the idea that you could 
separate off the armed forces from the rest of society seemed to be uh, obsolete. Uh, the, uh, and this was largely because of air power. It was possible to attack civilians and cities, uh, and there were all sorts of reasons developed as to why this could be a good idea. Uh, first, uh, because the uh, munitions factories, uh, munitions factories had workers, didn't that make them a legitimate target? Secondly, because the morale of the population seemed to be uh, an appropriate target. Soldiers uh, were disciplined, uh, knew how to take fire, but how could you expect civilians to take fire uh, in the same way? So leading up to the Second World War, uh, you have an assumption of panic and emotion uh, uh, shaping the way that a, that a war develops because of attacks on civilians. Look at the way, look at H.G. Wells' book or something like that. Um, now, after the Second World War, um, total war was raised to the next level with nuclear weapons. But of course, that had the effect of making great power war look foolish and far too dangerous. So we have what is erroneously called a long peace, erroneous because uh, there have been plenty of wars during this period, but not erroneous when you look at great power war. There hasn't been World War III, which is what people were expecting almost from the end of World War II. We haven't had the next in the series. Um, so nuclear weapons seem to play a role um, in dampening down the urges to war, making the major powers cautious and circumspect. And this is still working. Uh, the reason why uh, we're not fighting side by side with the Ukrainians and why the Americans are still being very cautious in what some of the things they hand over is because we don't want a nuclear war. Uh, equally, the reason why Russia has attacked uh, its neighbors who are not members of NATO, but not those who are members of NATO, is because they don't want a nuclear war either. So nuclear war still plays an important role in this context, containing it in some ways, um, although they're not being used. And I think that's why they haven't been used, because I think nuclear weapons serve Putin's purposes quite well at the moment, because if once he does use them, then all bets are off, and it's not clear um, what actually he could gain within this particular conflict. Um, by using them because there's plenty of means of escalation as he's demonstrated already. So the urge to total war seemed to be limited by the fact that it went to an extreme, that it just went too far. It was one thing to have the Blitz and Hamburg and Dresden, uh, and Tokyo and so on, but after that it, it was too far, too much. Um, uh, and that has been an influential factor in international affairs ever since. Furthermore, when those who were looking back at the Second World War considered the impact of the great air raids uh, of the period, they cast doubt on whether they had any strategic value at all. Because even if you batter um, the populations, if they, if they turns out as it did, that they can absorb the pain, that they can cope, that they become resilient. Um, and if, even if they feel miserable and demoralized, if they can't do very much about it because the political means of changing their government's policy aren't there for them, which is certainly the case in Nazi Germany, then um, in fact, what you've done is kill a lot of people and, uh, and destroyed a lot of buildings without having achieved very much. Now, there was a, a qualification to this, which is you can attack military-related uh, infrastructure, uh, energy systems, transport systems, and so on. Um, and if you have great accuracy, then you can do that, uh, as the Americans did, for example, in Desert Storm, and say this is still um, about affecting the battlefield. But there's a line there. Uh, and the Russians uh, have shown in the wars that they fought um, under Putin, in Chechnya, in, um, in Syria, uh, that they're pretty uh, 
uh, they're not very careful with civilian life. The Grozny in, in Chechnya um, uh, was bombed to smithereens some time ago. So that has been um, the, the, the two distinct ways of fighting. Uh, obviously, the Ukrainians have got no interest uh, in fighting on their territory in that way. Uh, and until recently, they didn't really seem to have very many means of challenging Russian territory. What's interesting uh, in recent uh, months is the increasing use of drones in particular, but also missiles now, to attack targets either within Russia um, or within occupied Crimea, and particularly uh, recently Sevastopol, where naval ships have been attacked. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so because Ukraine is seeking to liberate its territory, and its territory has been battered enough already, uh, it wishes to, see, to stay with the Western model. Uh, and of course, that's the model with which um, we are comfortable um, because it's force on force. Um, it, it's in, encouraging armies uh, to win battles and in the hope as you liberate territory, uh, that's going to make the difference. But it's difficult. Um, and this is where people are, I think, at this stage of the war, realizing some things about contemporary warfare uh, that are worth keeping in mind. Now, the first thing to note, and, and why it's difficult to draw too many lessons from this, is the limited air power available to Ukraine. Not without it. Um, they've done pretty well dealing with Russian air power. But an American campaign, a NATO campaign in these circumstances, would be dominated in the first instance by air power. It's not in this case. Secondly, um, in these circumstances, what one sees is the strength of defense. This has been true right from the start, um, not only in the, in, in the defense that um, the Ukrainians were able to mount uh, on the first days of the war, um, by and large, only where defenses are thin or weak has territory been taken. This was true of where the Russians made progress in the first days of the war in the south, it's in the east, uh, where the Ukrainians made progress a year ago in Kharkiv, where, where, where they had a, a, a successful offensive and liberated quite a bit of territory. Uh, but if you look at the, all the Russian offensives, which since the early days of the war have achieved very little, by and large ruined cities, um, uh, Severodonetsk and, and more recently Bakhmut, which they may lose again. Um, these are hard, grinding, grueling, uh, attritional battles, which the, they fought in a way which so their Soviet predecessors would have fought, um, using infantry uh, in a sense to help locate the enemy. So there's a concept of dispensable infantry, uh, which is pretty grim if that's you, um, uh, to be followed by artillery barrages. It, it, it's not a very clever uh, approach. And the West has recoiled from that because in the way that the West has talked about war um, over the last 20 years or so, um, or indeed longer than that, uh, we stress maneuver, that's how we do it. Um, not attritional methods, which is just trading firepower. We wish to do it by maneuver. And that's why there was a degree of uh, interest and excitement earlier in the year as Ukraine starts to be given the means of maneuver with tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and so on. Well, what it turns out is maneuver is difficult, um, which is not a surprise. Um, against minefields, um, uh, tanks can soon get it run into trouble. Uh, when you have a totally transparent battlefield, as we almost are having now, uh, the enemy can see you coming. And when they can see you coming, if they've got any systems of any accuracy, they can take you out. Now, the Russians have suffered from this probably more than the Ukrainians, but it's a feature of the war and it's shaped tactics so that all the tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, um, or, or some of them were lost in, in the first days of this counteroffensive, uh, a lot of them are still there ready to go. 
because it hasn't been sensible yet to put them into battle. The Ukrainians uh, are making progress through dismounted infantry. So that's, and they are making progress, uh, but, but it's difficult and slow. Um, and therefore, the hope-for battlefield victory is some distance away. It's not that progress can't be made, it's not um, that territory can't be liberated, but it's slow by this means. Now, these things can change very quickly, as they did with Kharkiv um, last year, uh, because an army that suddenly realizes that it's about to be uh, breached can break very quickly, uh, which is w what happened. Uh, but until that point, uh, it's very difficult. So what then of the total war side of things? Um, in uh, a year ago, um, just over a year, just under a year ago, when after the Kharkiv offensive, which was the moment when a sensible strategic actor would have decided to cut their losses, Putin doubled down. He did a number of things. Um, he went to full mobilization so they could plug in the gaps with more troops. Uh, he went to, um, he, he upped his political objectives. Normally in these circumstances, the sensible thing to do is to scale down your objectives, as he had done uh, in March uh, after the failure to take Kiev. Um, it, it seemed to suggest he was only interested in Donbass then. Uh, but because now he was under pressure from the ultra-nationalists uh, who were very cross with him for losing the best chance they had to take Ukraine, he, he uh, moved to the fake referendums and annexation of the four provinces, uh, Luhansk, Benet, uh, Kherson and uh, Zaporizhia, in addition to uh, Crimea, which they already taken, to become part of the Russian Federation. And every time somebody says let's have a diplomatic solution. This now is in the way. They've got to change their constitution uh, to have a peace settlement now. Because, uh, and every time you will see uh, when they talk about diplomacy, the Ukrainians are asked, and the West is asked to accept the new realities, which obviously they can't do and won't do. Um, and then the other thing he did um, was to appoint uh, General Sorovikin to be um, overall commander and Sorovikin's strategy, which he laid out very clearly uh, initially, was to shore up Ukrainian, the Russian defensive lines using the new uh, recruits um, and to mount a campaign against Ukrainians' critical infrastructure using drones and missiles and so on. His background is aerospace, Sorovikin. Um, so that, so he, that's uh, what they began to do. And this was a, the most efficiently organized part of the whole Russian war effort. It went on for months, um, and, the, and the Ukrainians coped. But it wasn't always easy. Last December, it got very close uh, to just losing the electricity grid. But they kept it going with a lot of help. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if this starts again, but they have a resilience now that they didn't before. They know, they know what to do. But that wasn't just an add-on to the Russian strategy, it was a critical part. Now, Sorovikin uh, is, is not only demoted, he's in disgrace because he was, uh, he and Prigozhin were allies. Um, he was the main contact with the Wagner group. So uh, after the mutiny in which he gave what looked like a hostage video pleading with Prigozhin to stop, um, he, he wasn't seen for a while. Now he's, latest he's been seen in civvies Actually, he's been seen in Algeria, so goodness knows what he's doing there. Um, but anyway, he, their most capable general um, is out of it. Um, and it's worth noting something else about uh, fighting with these sort of regimes, is that when you look at the top, the top people are chosen for their loyalty as much as their competence. Shoigu and Gerasimov, who have been there forever um, with Putin, uh, are failures. I mean, whatever happens, that this is a, a calamitous way to fight a war. Um, but they're loyal, and they won't cause him trouble. Whereas you could imagine if someone like Sorovikin appeared as, as the great war hero and had won the war, uh, he would be seen as a threat to Putin. So the total war aspects have become very important, 
but they haven't worked again. And um, other as total war aspects like the, uh, the treatment of Ukrainians in occupied areas have just made the Ukraine, again, another, another argument against negotiations. Why do we hand over territory to people who commit atrocities on that territory? Um, and the, uh, uh, so all of that has created a unity in Ukraine, despite um, just how difficult the situation is, which they don't really have a choice. They'll, 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 they, whatever, they'll, whatever we do, they'll keep going. A couple of final points. Um, on the politics of the war, because the politics of, of war is as important as what's going on with the weaponry. Um, the, the first day of the war, dis, I think, decided much of what happened afterwards. And it could have gone differently. It really is important to note um, that the Ukrainian defense of the Hostomel air, airport just outside Kyiv, was not a simple matter and was not foreordained. Um, they they, they were, got good intelligence. Um, they had units that weren't, uh, were almost spontaneously mobilizing themselves to get there uh, to deal with the threat. Uh, and it, it was a very brave operation. But as soon as parat Russian paratroopers couldn't land in that airport, the, the much of the immediate threat to Kyiv was eased, but also Zelensky stayed. Uh, the importance of Zelensky's uh, first not being killed or captured, which was a key part of the Russian plan, they relied too much on on their uh, on the FSB to have sorted out um, Ukrainian resistance before the troops arrived, and they in that they failed. Um, the fact that Zelensky was not uh, caught or killed. The fact that he could go on television and still talk to his people, the fact that he said he was staying, um, and in that other part of that famous message, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition, he established what he needed uh, and what he wanted from us and from others. Uh, and that led, uh, I think, to the final point. What Ukraine is doing is remarkable, but they're doing it with a lot of support. Uh, and it couldn't it just, it, they would fight. Many of us, um, when we were looking at the prospect of war before it started, uh, ass assumed Putin was crazy to start a war like this, not because we thought they would have trouble in battle, but because you can't occupy a country of that size, um, of that, uh, uh, that population, um, with a record of, of ready to take on um, invaders and oppressors. Uh, so they would have fought under any circumstance. We didn't necessarily expect the war to go, the, take the form it has taken. But it's the, the fact that it has taken this form has meant that uh, external support has been absolutely crucial. And what we've seen as a result is that the uh, loss of Russian forces uh, has turned them into much more of a sort of 20th century army fighting in 20th century ways, while Ukraine is slowly turning into a 21st century army um, with, with more modern equipment. A lot of it's still late, uh, late 20th century equipment, but it's more modern than quite a lot of the stuff the Russians are using. So how does it end? I don't know, um, uh, because uh, it, it's not evenly balanced. There's lots of different things going on, but it's difficult. Um, and I, uh, my view is it's unwise to assume um, quick victories, uh, knockout blows either side. I don't, think, I, I don't think that is likely, even if the Ukrainians take more territory, and I hope they will, I think they probably will over the coming weeks. We have to get ourselves in a mentality that this will go on. Why is that? Uh, a sensible Russian leader would have cut losses. A sensible Russian leader would be uh, proposing a ceasefire now because then they would have some territory to show for it if they could do it. They'd certainly put Zelensky in a difficult position, but that's not what Putin wants. He wants more Ukrainian territory, and he's waiting for the next American election. Um, he's made that very clear in, in, a, 
uh, a stroke, one of his stranger speeches. Uh, but he talked about political instability in the US and how Trump is being persecuted and so on. Uh, his, um, uh, his hope is that at the end of next year, the US will have a new administration. Uh, maybe it will. We, that's not under our control. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we have to keep we have to be aware that it's not actually that difficult for uh, Europe and North America to keep Ukraine going. It's a challenge for Ukraine with manpower and so on. But in terms of our budget, it's perfectly doable, um, and it's important that we do. The other thing that Ukraine can do is, uh, which I, is why I think the attacks on Sevastopol last week, which if you noticed, were missiles, possibly UK storm shadows, um, knocking out ships, including a submarine, in, um, in, in this really important port, is this really important port was at the heart of, this, of the whole issue in 2014. There are a number of reasons why Putin wanted uh, Crimea. Uh, I mean, most Russians never felt Ukraine should have had it in the first place. It was sort of a whim of Khrushchev in, in 1954 that it got handed over uh, when he was trying to cultivate the Ukrainian Communist Party. Um, it, um, it fitted in with their narrative about Russian language speakers being unhappy with the change of government in Kyiv. But as Sevastopol, this base on the, uh, uh, the edge of the, uh, of the peninsula, which um, was actually covered by a separate treaty, but never mind, um, that uh, was one of the reasons why they wanted to annex Crimea to keep Crimea uh, safe for Russia. And here it is showing it's not safe for Russia, uh, that it's vulnerable. I think things like this undermine and eat away at, at Russian confidence about where the war is going. But I don't know uh, how this ends because it depends on decisions being made in the Kremlin. We have to wait and see what happens. Thanks very much. Well, that's just the kind of masterly uh, survey that we uh, would have expected from you and, and uh, very much appreciated. But it gives us an opportunity to pick up uh, on some questions. And I know that you're uh, very happy to, to do that. So the floor is open. And uh, if anyone would like to ask a question or make a comment, you're welcome to do so. Gentlemen here and, and then Bob. I think it's important that we, we, we do what we can for Ukraine. I'm, uh, of, uh, I've followed many wars in my time. Uh, I don't, I found very few of them as morally clear cut as this one. Um, uh, you know, well, all the, keep in mind that we're not doing the fighting. Um, so, you know, it's really, Putin, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a famous line um, from Tsarist times from a Russian foreign minister um, 
which, which was the only safe border for Russia, is one with Russians on both sides of it. <laughs> um, and um, there's sort of an inbuilt paranoia in, in the worldview that comes out of the, the Kremlin. You know, we've got to, we've got to damn all Russians. There are many Russians resisting this, upset by this, who've left Russia, um, uh, who are supporting Ukraine. Um, but the worldview coming out of the Kremlin is paranoid, um, uh, cloaked in mythologies that they have created. So you don't know. I mean, so the real problem if you know, trying to follow Russian media, social media, things that are said, is you don't know what they actually believe. Some of it is clearly very cynical. Um, uh, uh, and the sort of thing you get whenever they've committed an atrocity and they blame the Ukrainians for doing it to themselves, and they're sort of done with a smirk. Uh, but some of it they, they seem to believe. Um, and... Um, the, the anger with NATO, I mean, they, they say they're at war with NATO, not with Ukraine, because part of the narrative is Ukraine is a proxy. Yeah, there's a, Ukrainians left to themselves wouldn't have done anything so foolish as to resist Russian occupation. So that's, the, that's their narrative. And that, um, uh, so, so NATO is responsible. Um, and... Um, some of the characters that those of you who watch this stuff will be familiar with. Uh, actually, what interestingly, uh, the country they're most annoyed with is us. I mean, an interesting feature of modern international affairs is only the Iranians and the Russians seem to believe that we have real power and influence in the world anymore. Um, so, it, it, and it, you know, it, it's a blustery language, full of threats and so on, but also to the Baltic states, to Poland, to, to anybody there. So, um, and while Putin is there, um, and whatever they, the, the, however much their army has been depleted, and it has been, and their air force and so on, they're still a major power. They've still got their nuclear arsenal, and they've still got their navy. They're losing bits of that, but they've still got most of it. Still got most of their air force. They're still a serious power, um, and they're still, and they feel themselves locked in this uh, confrontation with the West. Uh, and as long as they feel like that, uh, and we can't do anything to reassure them, uh, because we're not going to abandon Ukraine, then um, it, it's difficult, and that's why we've got to think long term as well. And um, Rob, there, the the, the, uh, the various uh, pieces coming from uh, Ministry of Defence and from um, uh, I was there this morning, um, and from uh, integrated review, I and mean, good documents in, in, in that they uh, clarify this. Now, will everybody else stay the same way? Will the alliance as a whole stay the same way? I think, with some exceptions, by and large, the major players are pretty committed to the stance they've taken. But but we have to you know, just get ourselves into into our heads that we're at one of those stages in history that happens now and again where how you deal with a threat of this sort makes a difference for the future. Yeah. Uh, it's just you know, one of those times, and we, we don't know the answer yet. Rob. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, so it's always uh, lovely to hear you talking about um, this subject, even though it's, for us, morally, one of the most difficult things uh, to, to deal with. I wonder if I just ask you um, to say a bit more about the short war, long war expectation. Um, because uh, this seems to be you know, an echo in many ways of Fritz Fischer's kind of famous remark about Germany in the First World War. This was a griff nach der Weltmacht, you know, a grasp for world power. And that Putin made it very clear before the war broke out that this was all about Russia's position in the world. This was not really a conflict about Ukraine at all. It was about conflict about us. And that this signing up of a unlimited friendship with China has always been part of this as well, that we know the Chinese don't want or won't let uh, the Russians lose this war, so to speak. They're counting on the fact that the West will simply lose patience because the West is expecting a short conflict. So I wonder if you might say something about how that early moment of um, what Putin expected was a three-day operation, it would all be over, there wouldn't be a war, but he's got a long war. 
that he, he, does, he doesn't think he can win on his own. In the West, we've had the expectation that, too, this will be a short thing, and it's turning out not to be. Could you, I know you're trying to avoid the how does this end question, yeah. but this, would you agree that this is a long conflict? This is about endurance. And how would you advise us or to help us think through that process of, of enduring a longer conflict and preparing ourselves mentally, perhaps intellectually, for this, the kind of war this actually is? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. First, every aggressor believes it's going to be a short war. Um, and, um, you know, you hope the main lesson of the would-be aggressors learn is that uh, wars are much easier to start than finish. Uh, now, you know, some, some wars start quickly and, and then quickly. Wars, wars in the desert don't lend themselves to this sort of uh, attrition. Wars in cities and so on do. Um, so that was the miscalculation. And I, you know, my view is, even if they'd succeeded, it would have still been a long war in which we would have got involved, but it would have been a different problem to the one we've got now, because you can't occupy, you know, we should know, we try to do it, you can't occupy uh, people who don't want you, where you're not welcome. So in that sense, um, it, what's happened is not a surprise. Um, how do we keep going? I, 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 you know, if you look back last year, indeed, you know, quite early into the war, people were talking about Ukraine fatigue and how, you know, the economic issues and the Germans would give up. And so on. It hasn't happened. I mean, by and large, um, the the Ukrainian cause is well understood. It may not be dominating the news cycle. Um, but by and large, we've, our countries have adjusted to what's going on. And the issues are now, what do we need to do, for example, ammunition production and so on, um, to help Ukraine sustain itself? We were, we were late on all of that. We took too long uh, to do it. So you know, it may take a year before we're really fully up to, start to get fully up to the production needed. This is NATO as a whole, not just UK. Um, so we've got to keep it going. Um, and this is a challenge, and we don't know what's going to happen with American politics, but because it was in Washington last week, and the de degree of irresponsibility in, in some, not all, parts of the Republican Party is stunning. Um, you, know, you can't get confirmation of all the senior leadership in the Pentagon at the moment because uh, one senator from Alabama is holding it all up on the grounds that... Uh, the Pentagon allows uh, uh, support flights for, for women who want to have abortions. Um, I mean, that's causing chaos in, in the American world at the moment. So it's, you know, it's hard to be totally sanguine about all of these things. But the administration itself uh, is pretty clear uh, that this is a policy that can be and will be sustained. So, and, and the more we can show that, um, and I think this is a message, again, if you watch some of the Russian media, is getting through that uh, despite all the bluster, the F-16s are coming. Attack them, I think, in some form, not necessarily the form the Ukrainians want, but a form will, will come. Um, shows that the, the, it, it is carrying on. The Ramstein group is meeting now. On the Russian side, um, so, you know, you, you raise Rob, the, the, the issue with China. I think it's a little different. I mean, I'm sure, Putin, uh, Z doesn't want Putin to lose, uh, but he's pretty annoyed with Putin. Um, and he's benefiting from the situation economically, uh, and he's helping Putin sort of economically. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, there's a current argument going on um, about how they're going to be paid, uh, the role of the ruble and the role of the yuan and the role of the dollar and all, and, and all of this. Um, and I thought the most um, telling thing was Kim's visit. Mm. So Kim did two things that Z has refused to do. Uh, the first was to endorse the Russian war effort. Kim has never done that. He, he's, he's always stayed neutral on it. And secondly, uh, Kim said he'd provide weaponry, or hinted as such. He, he wrote China whatever is going through in components and so on by the back door, hasn't done that 
either. When um, Wang Yi, who just met Blinken, um, announced that he's good with going to chief Chinese diplomat, announced he's going to, to Moscow, the, Russia, the, the, the Chinese um, announcement referred to, to discuss a settlement. Uh, I think the Chinese want this war over. Um, I, I don't think they like it. Um, uh, it complicates everything uh, and puts, keeps on putting them in a difficult position because they don't support it. Um, that's why um, the G20, although it didn't uh, it, condemn Russia in the way it talked about a peace, did so in terms that actually favor Ukraine. It was the Charter of the UN, International Humanitarian Law, whatever. So, um, I, I mean, my view is that, uh, that though we're quite gloomy about the support of the quotes unquote global south, um, the global south it, it, it thinks we're hypocrites, thinks uh, um, it's not inclined to support the West, um, quite likes the idea of a multipolar world and so on but it doesn't support Russia. And um, I was talking to um, uh, an Indian colleague about the G20 meeting, and she was saying that actually, um, although our take was, was that the wrong language wasn't, the right language wasn't there, the Russians were really annoyed with the language that was there. Um, and that's how it's been seen in, in India. Um, so um, I think this is a worry for Putin that, that, that you know if the if you end up relying on North Korea and Iran, it doesn't suggest your position is great. Um, they can make a difference. You know, Iranian, Iranian drones have made a difference. Um, North Korean artillery shells will certainly help. Ukraine has been getting South Korean artillery shells. Scott, and then gentlemen here. So what do you think of the proposition that um, supporters of democracy say that the concentration of power at the top, especially by someone who's not a military genius and who demands loyalty, sort of guarantees low quality decision making, which will ultimately lead to disastrous consequences. And the second part of that is that if there's a lack of accountability, total lack of public discussion, or variation of possibility, except on an extreme level on one side, that the when when there is this lack of accountability, the possibility of cascading set of events and a country turning on a dime uh, is possible. And those two factors, if the West sustains its support in Ukraine, favors um, eventual victory. Yeah. Um... So, I, I mean, I, I'm a strong believer in, in that aut autocracies tend to make pretty awful decisions. Uh, they can be bold uh, and audacious in ways that we can't. Um, but that also means that the decisions being taken aren't subject to scrutiny. And, uh, you know, Putin uh, didn't consult widely within, within Moscow. Um, the Ukrainian experts in, in Moscow were not consulted. Um, this is a lot of um, old men with, it, with, it, with, his, with the same worldview sitting around the table, uh, having isolated themselves during COVID, uh, and Putin having read far too many history books, which he didn't understand, um, coming up with, with, a, with a crazy decision, uh, which has had, you know, I mean, it's something that should make us really angry, the number of lives that have been lost because of one man uh, uh, deciding this was going to be his legacy is, is appalling. So they do work. One should qualify that by noting democracies can make some pretty awful decisions on these things too. It's not that we always get everything right. But we, at least we have corrective mechanisms, feedback loops, we might say, uh, that, that, that help us on these things. Whereas um, the problem for authoritarian states is um, they can't admit the mistake for aut autocracies. And you could see that uh, some of the problems in Beijing as well, uh, things that look very brilliant and bold, uh, party decisions uh, a number of years ago don't look so clever now. Um, 
whether that mean how brittle that makes them is hard to know. Um, uh, you know, when these, it always seems inevitable when it happens, um, but it can take a long time before it does. And you know, every country's got its own political culture. Uh, the, the things Russian troops put up with stuff that would be scandals if they were uh, expected of Western troops, of our troops. Um, and uh, there's sort of stoicism to it, uh, a, a, a belief that in some way you're owned by the state and you're loyal to the state that um, keeps it going. You would have expected more mutinies by now in some ways. And there have been little ones, but and there are reasons why they haven't happened apart from Prigozhin, which was a very special case. It was basically because uh, the Minister of Defence was attacking his business model, you know, <laughs> about cop finance. Um, so um, we don't know. I mean, Putin has created a system which is very difficult to imagine anybody else running at the moment. He hasn't anointed a successor. It was obvious he's scared of anointing a successor. Um, so, you know, mortality alone uh, creates a, a vulnerability in the system. Uh, and if it you know, my, my argument all the way through this has been essentially, we have to assume this will go on for a long time. It's the only prudent assumption to make. But things can happen. And we don't have transparency of the Kremlin. We don't know. Um, there are hints. There, there are you know, insiders. The technocrats are not happy and so on. We don't know. Uh, he's ill. We don't know. Uh, he, eight doctors go with him wherever he goes. Maybe. You know, we, we, this rumor and hearsay. Um, but at some point, something may happen. Uh, so just because we don't know doesn't mean to say we just have to assume he can last, outlast us all. I don't think that's necessarily true. But we don't have sight and we don't have, it's not something we can engineer. And also we've got to be quite careful because the day, I don't think it, it, it's a good idea for us to, to so, you know, our aim is, uh, is the collapse of the Russian Federation. So, uh, it, it's not necessarily a good thing to happen. And uh, it just confirms his messages if that's what we say. So I think we just have to assume he's going to stay there um, and hope that the uh, hope that, that he goes and if not that the pressures that are building up and, and are building up um, eventually uh, make him realize that he needs a way out but nothing to be guaranteed gentleman over here Um, from where we are now, has this taught us anything about war crimes and war criminals and what we ought to do about them? Or is it just confirmed that there's very little we can do about these? Whatever you want to call them. Well, they're war crimes. Um, it's a big issue. I don't, I don't think we... Uh, uh, and it'll be difficult to conclude the conversation until the war is over. The International Criminal Court has... Uh, uh, has indicted Putin. We can't, you know, he didn't go to South Africa. He didn't go to India. Um, he, he's not, uh, he's got an issue now with his travels. Um, I think it's going to be, if one tries to think ahead to a peace negotiation, uh, and, you know, the, the best I suspect we can expect is a ceasefire, but if one is trying to think ahead to that. War crimes is one of the issues. It matters enormously to the Ukrainians. Um, there, and there are a number of organizations, that are, not just the ICC, um, a number of organizations collecting evidence on what's gone on. They have the names. Um, I mean, there have been a few Russian soldiers that, that have been charged, uh, but they know what, and they have the names. Uh, will it be dealt with by by courts? I don't know. More likely, you'll have some sort of commission um, that will will name names. But it matters enormously to the Ukrainians that this is kept on the table because the you know this was done in plain sight. It's not that these were uh, uh, and uh, more evidence is being 
and covered all the time. And if more territory is liberated, more evidence will, will come up. So um, I think it, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's one reason why the war will go on, um, because the Ukrainians, having seen what the Russians are capable of, um, are not going to yield to this sort of um, uh, atrocity. Uh, but how you handle it is, is a different matter. But so far, international organizations have not run away from it. It's just how do you, you know, how do you bring Putin to trial? Because you know there's not going to be armies marching into Moscow and taking over the Kremlin. Uh, so you're not going to get your Nuremberg uh, at the end of this. But you know it, 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 the the word can still get out. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the Ukraine's putting a lot of effort into getting it. It's just, but it's one of the issues that I think will make a, a peace settlement pretty difficult. We've come to the end of our time, uh, and what, but what I'm going to suggest is that we, we, we wind it up in the formality here, but I do see that there's a lot of glasses of wine down there, and I think you may be able to get the hold of uh, Sir Lawrence and continue on with a little bit of conversation uh, and, and questions. Uh, but at this point, I'd just like to say a very sincere thank you. You've, you've spoken in very thoughtful and realistic terms, quite solemn terms in, in many ways, uh, uh, pointing to the very real challenges. This is not going to be an easy thing. It's not going to finish soon. There are all sorts of consequences which we, we can't really see. Uh, the, the thought that we were into some kind of new form of war, well, actually, there's new bits, but a lot of the old bits are still there with a vengeance. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a thoughtful, but it's a solemn kind of uh, presentation that you've given us, which I'm sure is, is really rather important. Uh, and, of course, it's clear that we are going to have to find ways of dealing with this over quite a period of time. I think one of the interesting uh, things is that at the start of all of this, I think there were some real questions around about how robust Europe was going to be. I think that view has probably changed now, not least because much of Europe has begun to realize how vulnerable it is uh, in this context. But from my point of view, an absolute delight uh, to, to listen to you. Uh, and I think we all can express our appreciation to Sir Lawrence for a marvelous presentation and discussion. Thank you very much. Indeed.